When you browse the internet, all kinds of companies are trying to track your movements, follow you from page to page, get access to personal data that they can monetize. Cookies have historically been a very popular tool for this tracking. They're little bits of text that are downloaded to your browser and act like storehouses of information. But browsers have started preventing cookies from being used to invade their users' privacy, and most browsers now block third-party cookies. So surveillance and advertising companies had to come up with sneakier ways to track your activity. Enter the tracking link. They moved the tracking mechanisms from the cookie directly to the URL itself. Tracking links are a way of, of sites being able to track you across the web to circumvent recent browser protections. They're everywhere, they're very common, and browsers are just starting to get serious about trying to strip them out and protect user privacy. Peter Snyder is the Senior Director of Privacy and Senior Privacy Researcher at Brave Software, and he explained to me that all that junk you see at the end of many URLs is used to track which websites you visit. You'll see click ID equals some very long string after the URL you intend to go to. The tracking part is used to say, I came from this site and I'm going to this site and I'm the same person on both places. There's a range of information that can be included in these tracking links. Sometimes they might be totally benign and it's like this thing is on result page three or whatever. It gets less benign when these links start identifying where on the web you clicked the link. For example, you might see a URL that says user campaign equals Twitter. And that just means like the person found the link on Twitter, it's that's semi-identifying, but there'll be lots of other people found the link on Twitter. But on the other side of the spectrum, these tracking links can get chillingly specific. The most kind of concerning is like, the person who generated this link is cookie identifier XYZ3000, whatever. It turns out that tracking links can contain a lot of sensitive information, and we're not always aware of it. Things like the search terms you use to find the link, the name of the website where you clicked the link. They might even include the MAC address of your computer, your IP address, your name. Who ends up getting access to this data? It's very hard to find out because most of the companies collecting this data go out of their way to remain obscure and are almost impossible to track down. When this blogger dug into the privacy policy for the PC gaming website Rock Paper Shotgun, he found that by default, his data was being shared with 622 advertising companies across the far reaches of the internet, and many companies you've never even heard of just from one website visit. The first step to protecting yourself from this kind of privacy invasion is learning how to spot a tracking link. If you're already familiar with them and just want to know how to protect yourself, feel free to skip ahead. A super hand-wavy metric that you can use is if you see a link with a question mark and a whole lot of junk at the end, it's probably a tracking link. Let's analyze three different examples and what they tell us. Here is one common looking tracking link that uses the UTM standard, supported by Google Analytics. UTM stands for Urchin Tracking Module because it was first introduced by a company called Urchin. They were then bought by Google and turned into Google Analytics, which is now the most widely used web analytics service in the world. These links can contain five parameters helpful for tracking the effectiveness of marketing campaigns, like which website sent the traffic, which search terms were used to find the link, etc. Major platforms usually have their own internal analytic standards though, and the URLs aren't quite so easy to reason about. This is a typical Amazon link that you'll get if you copy directly from the URL bar. But this is all that's actually necessary to get to the product page. All this extra stuff is to help their massive data collection machine. This part is called the base URL. This is Amazon's internal code for the product. And this is all additional product data, internal codes, and unique identifiers. We don't know what information is hidden in identifiers like this number here. Perhaps your computer hardware's ID number. Perhaps all the mailing addresses connected with your account. Amazon is very secretive about how their tracking works and who this data is shared with, but we do know that it's shared with a lot of partners. Finally, let's look at Twitter tracking links. A normal Twitter link, if I copy directly from the URL bar, looks like this. But when I click copy link to tweet, they give me a link that packs in all kinds of tracking data. Your guess is as good as anyone's about what data is actually being included in this long string of digits. But you can bet that anyone who clicks on it will be immediately traced back to you. Do you think that it's worthwhile for people when they're sending someone a link to just be mindful of what's at the end of that string? There's definitely reason to be concerned or to be cautious about it. If you keep too much of it, you may be unintentionally identifying either the person who provided you the link or the, the place you found the link on. 
someone, which might be saying something about you. Because of this, when I share a link with someone, I try to remember to delete everything after the question mark first. But spotting a tracking link isn't always so easy. Have you ever noticed that when you're loading some websites, a bunch of other URLs will show up at the bottom of the page while it's loading? You're being bounced through a bunch of other tracking websites first before getting to your final destination. These intermediary sites are all logging where you're coming from and going to and collecting other information about you as well. It's called bounce tracking, and it's how many websites circumvent the cookie blocking built into most browsers. When you click on one of these links or an advertisement or whatever it might be, and it takes you through four different origins, what you're seeing there is the different tracking providers that are all collaborating and, and, and tracking you across those ad links. Advertisers use these to build up profiles of users, even in ways that users may never actually see because they, they visit those origins or those URLs so briefly. So yeah, you really do need some kind of tooling to, if you, if you want to make a meaningful strike at the problem. There are many automated tools that can help block tracking links. My go-to is Brave Browser because they block more unwanted advertising and tracking links than any other browser. First of all, if I'm using Brave, it doesn't matter if I click on a link with a bunch of tracking stuff after the question mark, Brave will automatically strip out that part of the URL before navigating me there. So as long as you're using Brave, you can be confident that those will never be provided or included in a URL you copy paste to somebody. To combat the sneaky bounce tracking, they have two solutions. Either skip you over the, the, the tracking domain, or we can visit it in this kind of like throwaway storage area so we can make sure there's no identifiers present. What does this mean exactly? Well, let's say you click on an ad and it's sneakily bouncing you through a bunch of trackers before taking you to the site that you want to visit. Certain browsers may want to protect you, but they won't see anything suspicious about the URL itself. So they'll say, okay, we can't reason about the URL, but we know that the, the intermediate domain is always suspect. The browser will learn over time that this particular link type is always bouncing you through these tracking websites first. And it learns to just skip over the tracking sites and take you straight to the final destination. We know that the pattern is always A to tracker to B, and so we're, we're able to, to learn this over time and just cut out the middle first and go A to B. It's called debouncing, and Brave has the only version of this that ships in the browser. And when they can't figure out what the ultimate destination is in order to skip over it, they do something called unlinkable bouncing. We'll have you visit the, the tracking domain, the intermediate domain in a, a throwaway profile, a throwaway storage area. The intermediate domain never builds up a profile of you because we throw away storage for it every time, every time you leave it. So next time you come back, the tracking site won't be able to know it was the same person who visited. Brave has by far the most aggressive version of this unlinkable bouncing tool that ships in the browser. We can be a better cat than they can be mice. The final thing that Brave does to fight tracking, which makes them worth singling out, is that they're not afraid to create one-off tools that specifically target certain companies like Facebook or Google. There's one approach to building browsers that say we should only have browser privacy protections that apply globally. So that might be things like partitioning storage or limiting third-party cookies like the same policy should be applied to everybody on the web. That's by far the majority view. And I think if, if you're building a browser and you're not willing to name bad parties and treat them harshly, then you're not serving your users well. They ship hundreds of thousands of rules identifying specific bad actors on the web, and they don't shy away from putting them in a box that they wouldn't put a normal site in. We feel like that's part of our job. The big takeaway here is that trying to combat tracking links manually just won't cut it in most cases because surveillance companies have become so sophisticated. It's a pretty impossible task or certainly an unpleasant task for people to audit every single URL they ever send to a person. Luckily, there are many automated tools out there that can help. The main goal is to have a web that's privacy preserving and user first. It's really beholden on privacy preserving software to, to take on some of this responsibility. One of the most important things that you can do is choose your browser well, because a good privacy preserving browser will take on much of this heavy lifting for you, helping you to carve out some private space in your digital life. It's not that I have something to hide. I have nothing I want you to see.